Hello everyone, today we talk about military theory from the late Middle Ages to the Thirty Years' War, passing through the ideas of thinkers such as Machiavelli, Delanue, um, Manius, Van Valhausen, etc., observing the, um, the, the birth, let's say, of the awareness, at least the rationalized one, um, the conceptualized one in the treatises, of the need for a practical application of a theory of the art of war. The next step in this would be uh, Montecuccoli about whom we made uh, a video as the milestone between military theory between Machiavelli and von Clausewitz as a matter of fact. And we also made uh, a video about the, the before, a bit medieval military mm, treatises, the first ones from which today we we start observing how humanism, the Renaissance, brought in this important revaluation not just of, of a philological property in the, for example, in the understanding of the classical works, but in this regard, of course, of a greater systematization of the same military thought. So the military treatises were um, already a florid literary genre in antiquity, as we know, from Xenophon uh, to Caesar or Frontinus, Bajetius. Um, and the, the tradition of which had been continued, especially in the Byzantine world, uh, especially in the early Middle Ages. And, um, of course, we know what we're, we're talking about today, we, we don't digress on that, but th there is all, uh, there would, it would be interesting to, to explain how and why these cultural trends occurred and, or they, they were channeled in some cultures specifically, etc. But Today we talk about the West, and so we can see essentially from that still in Latin Germanic, uh, Latin Germanic Europe through the works of Isidore of Seville and Bede uh, de Venerable, um, there was always an attention um, towards uh, warfare, and there was practically no encyclopedia that wouldn't dedicate to the armies and the arms. Uh, uh, an important specific part of its own work right and if we go across we, we know of course that classical uh, heritage had not been forgotten that the Jetsis was always there was studied we find even you know uh, Carolingian counts uh, treasuring the Jetsis properly not just because of the the value that manuscripts had material at the time but you know as a properly a, as a, a source of, of knowledge of wisdom to be applicable. These were military, by the way, th this is, you know, th this rarely happened because Carolingian counts were mostly uh, illiterate and, you know, very much so, right? But the, we even find, in, of course, a continuity uh, for what we can track even from those times of this this knowledge that was, was considered important by men who surely were not to be told how to, to make war by anybody at the time, uh, but that they still, you know, who still considered this useful and for their children to learn, and also improperly for the craft of arms itself. And if we pass to the, to the low Middle Ages, we see even some great m municipal scholars, such as Brunetto Latini, for example, had a, quite of an international encyclopedic knowledge, who um, debated in his, uh, debated on war in his uh, Trésor or Christine de Pizan as a Venetian French who um, you know dedicated to war another important attention uh, but there are other great names such as uh, Honoré Beauvais uh, etc and in the spe specifically the Dere Militari of the Jetsis could even boast the uh, vernacularization by the pen of Jean de Mont that was the author of the Roman de la Rose. So this shows naturally, uh, indeed, um, a great attention and uh, a proliferation of, of the same towards uh, military treatises in, this, in the wake of classical uh, literature, of course, but also for the sake of, of, of some degree of practical application. Uh, we find also more more, mm, say, updated, properly original and modern, we could say, ideas in, in the lower Middle Ages. For example, there, there, there is all um, a literary genre uh, about the crusade between 
the, the 13th and 14th century, that is essentially between the Council of Lyon and the one of Vienne. Um, and there are so many authors, such as Fidencius from Padua or Benedetto Zaccaria, uh, Pierre Dubois, Jacques de Molay, um, Marin Sanudo the Elder. All these authors resumed and developed certain tactical, strategical uh, topics that were uh, already present, as we've seen, and never died out historically. Um, and uh, being always, yes, looking at the, the past authority, but also at the present practice. And this was the case, especially uh, uh, among the, uh, the maritime republics that were, as you know, quite active, militarily speaking, also had an important, here the Venetian names are not random, because, you know, th those were statal system properly meant, that had a, a very a very solid um, grip on the, the, the political and social realities, and therefore were the, the first places in this kind of humanistic, in part, but not even, but properly, you know, kind of modernizing context, the uh, the need of theorizing properly the, a, a practical application of war. And the, this genre was uh, essentially about articulating the war plans uh, in, a, in a particular complex fashion, right? And in, at least in theory, they, they do seem brilliant and original. They're very insightful, as a matter of fact. Of course, um, these were not yet the times in which military theory really, you know, describe uh, or could prescribe, actually, the practice and, you know, with a positive effect of application. But th there were... The, the proof that, because there was no need of that, because the, those who made war were were aware, first of all, of these ideas, and, and, and secondly, they knew how to make war. Most of the times, they didn't need to write down how to make war, because in a sense, war was so, you know, um, was, was was still at a stage of development, let's say, that, that didn't require that the backing with a theoretical, um, with a sy systematic theoretical inquiry on it, right? And this, again, has nothing to do with making war better or worse, uh, say, compared to to other times. This has simply to do with the idea that the system was simpler, and so there was literally no need for, for theory, which is something that would complete itself, as a matter of fact, only with von Clausewitz, even throughout all the modern age, right? And we've seen it already in other videos, how, and also through the, you know, the, the von Krieger that explains this, as a matter of fact, how these steps occurred and why, right? And we see there perfect logic and coherence and and, and reason why uh, such connection was w had not yet been established. But in this maritime military, uh, say, this military treatises of the maritime republics, uh, there are very interesting ideas that keep in, in account, for example, the relation between war and the economy. Therefore, understanding the political subordination of, of the same and um, in some cases also the economical blockade as a strategical mean right and so this was uh, was evident even just uh, in fact of how the Crusades were waged especially after the loss of Jerusalem and the, the realization that blockading the Egyptian ports would have you know would have brought an enormous political pressure on Egypt to even allow the Crusaders to take Jerusalem or to make properly the uh, uh, the 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 Ayyubids, the Mamluks collapsing at that point, that was the idea. It was also a pretty spot on one because this these ideas were not just invented by people who were writing, uh, you know, out of fantasy, right? Pro probably these ideas circulated because those who were involved in military operations had, you know, clearly understood them, right? Because they, they're not even particularly complex, and that's. In fact, part of the reason why certain authors could write about that, and and still not considering this this work as uh, necessary, but just kind of an invitation or a way to to put in on paper at that point something, uh, you know, just for for other people who are also not necessarily competent to to learn and think about Polit it's political reason, as you understand. So as we were saying before, humanism brought uh, fatally together with itself a revaluation or at least a more philological correct reading of the ancient military 
signs, and especially the Roman one. Uh, because, uh, well, this, this has to do naturally also with the, the different rate in which Latin and, and Greek uh, were, were, were spread in the West in the first place, in a humanistic sense. Uh, but not only, um, let's say that the, the memory was, was connected properly to what also the Romans had accomplished, what still in Europe was thought about that in terms of the legacy and the fact that it was still a Roman Empire, technically speaking, speaking of the Holy Roman Imperial one, Proper. And um, and so the, there there is uh, an, an obvious evidence of the fact that the memory of these treatises had never ended, as we were noticing. However, there is uh, even in here a, a gradual uh, awareness acquired uh, towards the venerated classical texts and the needs of a time that going through important social or uh, or technological data mutations had changed also the art of war per se um, so obviously when the humanists looked at the the Roman past and they thought it was the the, the, the greatest thing that had ever happened they were so backwards so that they invented the idea of the Middle Ages as the Dark Age and still modern people believed this without even contextualizing of course humanists were more intelligent than today's people on, on average in the first place and that tells it but um, the, um, uh, the the the, the, the what, what they didn't realize as a matter of fact is that the late medieval civilization was already more advanced than the ancient one and and probably from a military point of view the forces were being you know unleashed at that point were, were proving that um, you see certain versions of the Jetsus had already created problems and misunderstandings in a historical, linguistic call and, al and also semantic sense. For example, think about the word miles, through which the Latin treatiser indicated the legionary infantryman, while the medieval tradition was habituated to, 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 to see in it, at least from, from the 10th century onwards by approximation the heavy cavalrymen. Um, but even more arduous, and that's why, by the way, these texts had even not, uh, could not be uh, applied for, for, for any positive purpose, because, uh, and, and that tells you how they really believed, and, and they, they actually thought of these texts uh, by, you know, uh, and we're talking specifically also about the people who made war, and there were starting to be at this time also in considerable numbers, that were obviously aware that they weren't the same thing, right? So the it was not really a blind application of the principle. It was a way of saying, you know, everybody who is at war knows that a manual like that cannot really tell you anything, and Vegetius, by his own admission, was not even an expert on military matters. But that was objectively the only text practically that circulated about the art of war from, from ancient times in the West. In the West. Uh, because of course the Renaissance brought back also a lot of Greek stuff from the, the Byzantine refugees and all, but let's say even in there, th th there are some other reasons why the Hellenic <coughs> treatises were, were received in another fashion. In any case, um, it was really understood that was that there couldn't be a literal copy of that and so we shouldn't interpret even the renaissance like that because the renaissance was a highly elitistic world right and most of what we rightfully praise in uh, you know as an advancement of civilization and the arts and crafts and uh, science and technology uh, is, is very often you know a, a, a diamond tip that floated on, on an ocean of um, otherwise unknown very often uh, practical reality and uh, empirical experience it's, uh, and etc that that we uh, it, that is not documented it was actually much more you know interesting than we think and w there we would find so many other Leonardo's or Michelangelo's that maybe I don't know didn't make it because they didn't have enough sponsor for, for that man and it's always the case right um, but um, Militarily wise, was even more hard was to adapt the Roman thesis 
to a war in which now firearms were occupying an ever greater role, uh, an ever greater importance. And in fact, it's not by chance that the most rigorous makers of the more antiqua of war, mm -hmm. Machiavelli first of all, uh, didn't actually um, have such a great, uh, you know, uh, fate. Let's say in this, in this way, in 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 the new weapons, in in firearms, and there was uh, indeed a. A strong cultural resistance, not pretty much everywhere. Um, actually, Machiavelli was coming from one of the most secularized areas. It really didn't have much of a problem with that. It's not even a particularly feudal culture in nature, but you can imagine in many cultures that were founded on, and also very different ones, founded properly on a question, on the preeminence of a question warfare like France or, or even the Tartars, etc. That, uh, yes, we see this greater lamentation, complaint about great heroes, think about Bayard, etc., shot, you know, as, as one of the greatest knights, men at arms at the time, you know, simply killed by uh, a broken spine, by a broken spine, by, by, by an archibus shot, just like anybody else, um, or, and, and, and the, and yet the spread of firearms still in those systems, France having actually a very strong park of artillery. The reason we maybe they think that they were more opposed to was the uh, entrance of commoners in the army. We'll see it I in a while with uh, Delanou, as a matter of fact. And there is a picturesque compendium of, um, mm, say, badly understood classical elements and new instances, also not devoid of some sort of genius indeed, with for example, the De Re Militari by Roberto Valturio, edited in 1472, while in uh, the Ballo of, uh, of 1524 by Battista della Valle, there was at least the resolution, in theory, of the dilemma of the uh, integration of firearms in, uh, in fact, our battle arrays inspired at least to antiquity, by antiquity. So, when we arrive to the Arte della Guerra, the Art of War, um, written between 1520 and 1521, uh, for Machiavelli the true problem was not much a military one anymore, but a political one indeed. And this is really um, an important, uh, crucial turning point in Western civilization in the first place, because this is... This is really the beginning of modernity as such, right? The detachment also of the probably the political action from the, the religious principle in order to make you know, then there is the, there is something deeper about that and uh, it's not surprising that Machiavelli would exp inspire so much uh, also uh, Protestant thinking in these matters. Uh, but we'll not talk about that specifically. Also think about the relation with you know, virtue between virtue and fortune, and how that also intertwines with with the problem of grace, if you want, and salvation uh, in parallel. But that's that's another issue. Um, so, according to Machiavelli, the coming back to the ancients didn't have to be um, such uh, in the art of war properly, but rather the way he said in the art of liberty, right? And this. Uh, um, say beyond uh, his mistakes of interpretation of the ancient military um, art and um, definitely even more his mistakes of approach towards the political realities of his own time because Machiavelli was fundamentally an ambassador in the, you know he, he had a quite bureaucratic education, there is something mechanic, logical, rational, it is a beautiful red, it's, it's mind-opening, uh, Machiavelli alone is, is worth uh, Sun Tzu, there is no doubt about this, um, but the, the real deal of his work is, is about this, is the uh, fundamental interpretive key of the political and, and nature of this, uh, of war in itself, um, and reading uh, this text um, is 
indeed treating not you know much really a history of military thought but in in, in reality something much deeper that can be read through one of the most famous quotes from the Principe, as a matter of fact, that is, without having its own arms, no principality is safe. Mm-hmm. And the art of war had translations, readers, uh, you know, let's say appreciators, critics, all over Europe, also because, uh, indeed, um, it came to be part of the of the long polemic that had uh, developed around properly the the character and the thought of Machiavelli. Uh, and we don't have to forget how the same author was the first among the inspirers of, uh, as a matter of fact, of the Huguenot military thinkers, and in particular of the great genial François de Lannoy, who drew directly from Machiavelli, albeit, you know, backing um, it with some considerations uh, on, on, on properly the political religious plan, both the thesis uh, that the, the defense of a free res publica could not be uh, entrusted to the corruption of the mercenary troops, or the alleged corruption, we'll see now, um, but to the arms of uh, its own citizens, right? Uh, mm, That, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, distinguishes properly even the the, the wall point at the root with with the problem, for example, of having, you know, just a a better military institution per se, right? Just think about uh, training and discipline. Well, such a, a a second half of the... 16th century author like Delanue, even envisaging properly that there was there was a political problem at the root, procured times dramatically because at that point well, still armies were were to find out a, a way of functioning in a in a in a in a way that could put up with the changes of the time. Still, there were the, this endless proofs in the in the gradual, you know, uh, in the balancement uh, and and the gradual passage, let's say properly from from the pike to the harquebus, the musket, um, that would so much, in fact, occupy the minds of some of the greatest classicists and uh, also military reformers of those same times. Because, especially in a country like France, that in that period was definitely witnessing one of its periodical uh, political, social art- earthquakes, um, in, you know, th- there could be uh, such a a valiant commander like De La Nue, that uh, if you know the story, it's, it's really remarkable. Um, check his biography and his military history proper, because he was one of those people who really was fighting everywhere, the highest levels of French military culture, being a Huguenot and remaining so, actually, but at some point also, you know, defeated serving the Catholics, but being requested and, uh, you know, by 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 the Protestants, again, as a, as a commander and the, the same... Catholics allowing that, perhaps using him as also as a spy uh, in the, in that context. But that, that let's say we will read now how modern certain thoughts are, because really between uh, Delanu and uh, Louis the Fourteenth there is less than one century, and between Louis the Fourteenth and and the French Revolution there is less than one century. And so the problem also of the masses and the idea of of the nobility as a caste and its prerogatives. It, th- these are s- already thoughts that are, you know, appearing here. And, um, and Delanue's point is about a, uh, essentially an ethical improvement of the soldiers and their habits. Because now we quote, I'll try to translate simultaneously. So, and if some, this is Delanue, if, if somebody uh, wished to accuse me to draw pleasure from the critics that I ad- address to different people, I will respond that um, being a question of cancelling um, the stains that are be- have been produced in, in every estate, every, every class, it, it is necessary for uh, 
for, first of all to to show them right and from my side um, I will um, not denounce those that uh, that I, I will denounce only those uh, of the orders of which I am part of the nobility that is of the men at arms and um, recalling in front of the eyes the you know the the bad deeds the the corruption the the misdeeds let's say better that the nobility commits towards the people in time of peace when they uh, come back to their own master um, and when they uh, they you know they have to show up for, for the military services and when they come back or when they ch they, they change garrison and it will be seen that the noblemen even when they get paid even if they get paid um, they themselves do not really pay anything and that it is necessary to serve them uh, meals of by of uh, 20 uh, uh, 20 solid as it's usually said and that at their uh, leave from the from the their their lodgement uh, it, it's also needed for the host to make some gift to them and these burdens may even seem irrelevant but I think that they sum up to a more um, to more than a million and two hundred thousand pounds a year and um, and and th there will not be any let's say verbal public lamentation that let's say uh, the defense that will constitute the most adequate remedies I mean to such practice and it is necessary that when some of the noblemen is harshly punished this has to serve an example for, for, as, an, uh, as, a, as an example for, for others and who doubts again of the existence of some infantry commanders that albeit being paid for 100 men they, they don't have in their companies but 30 and they uh, you know mock he was not so you know shrewd by calling him tight-fisted well this intolerable theft this intolerable theft constitute a, a great uh, uh, damage for for uh, for the country of the king that could not be repressed with exemplary punishments at least this is this would be you know for for the gentleman and um uh, this would still be bearable given the times that uh, you know we are living in but at, at this point um it's uh, it's like stealing as a deliverer fundamentally those who steal from the things that they they ship the men at arms can say uh you know they use uh, they use us but there is not even the the smell of go of, of money this case it's because they are devoid of the benefit of pay they ha they have to be um say um they have to be exempted from the rigor of law right so this is accepted even if they leave at this correction but when with the excuse of being poorly paid they abandon to violent and infamous actions they do not have any excuse because as i said they do not have any privilege if not the one of living with moderation at the expense of the people and speaking of those young men who are sent to the infantry regiments they are in good numbers and they they go there when they're 16 uh, 15 16 17 years old uh, in the past they were mm, you know put in the um, Compagnie d'ordonnance as archers, because they they were a bit ahead in in the years and um, and at that point in, in in such companies there was nothing but nobility while the captains showed themselves in maintaining discipline. So many went in the uh, mm, uh, the bande d'ordonnance of, of Piedmont. We made a video about infantry of the French infantry of the Italian wars, and we have seen the the infantry bands of Piedmont. If, if you're interested, you can find data there. Where the in fact the the rules were excellent, and now instead that discipline is subversed also among the infantry, uh, 
uh, it, it it is for the for the young for the youth uh, a, a dangerous institution because not having them as masters most of the times um, but dissolute people with time bad examples draw them into corruption and instead of um, improving their education they compromise it definitely uh, and w also what is of use knowing how to shoot an archibuse knowing of uh, sentry of, 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 of watchers of, of sentries of skirmishers and giving proof of a fierce soldiery um, you know control if as a counterweight um, one just uh, abandons himself to numer innumerable vices there the uh, swearing against God reign the um, the the quarrels with friends the the gamble which they lose even the, the their own shirt the dirty uh, loves with um, with women without decency and as um as the the top of the disorder um, restless uh, uh, license in uh, beating sacking and exfoliating the people without any compassion and if discipline was imposed and observed and if those who follow it would show themselves in the first place courteous towards their their kin obedient to their superiors humans um, towards the people courageous against the superbs um, and it, in um, in particular against the enemy everybody would ap estimate them more than for their daily uh, today's excesses and uh, you know flying from place to place the flame uh, the, the fame of uh, such a beautiful institutions the noble souls would um, detest the uh, usitated uh, you know sins and they would actually w wish they would dish wish to to make part of them I would desire that uh, some costumes um, that the, the 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 Spanish observe among them to be practiced that they seem to me rather good one of this is that when some new soldier comes to their unit the veterans uh, teach him uh, instruct him about his duties if he makes some mistakes they correct them and if he is poorly equipped they help him so that he wouldn't be dishonorable for the nation and he from his side considers the admi this admonitions like a, a good service that was rendered to him among us the French the opposite happens because if a young man that enters in a company does something wrong even a stupid silly thing he is uh, mocked by everybody if he has um, some money he will immediately found himself um, tricked uh, in by gambling or true by mean of some other some other you know bravado let's say and thus many are disgusted by this you know an un, un, unhappy approach and n nor I want to by the way uh, be silent about a mistake that our youth does um, that is if one wants to amicably um, reproach them that is to say if they um, if they you know they, they have an argument with their superiors and they they, they take it badly uh, such as their uh, age was not subject to to mistake furthermore among the Spanish in six months there is never a quarrel because they despise the troublemakers and they they like they enjoy being moderate and if there is a an argument they uh, d there is uh, they, they you know behave uh, diligently to to, to to recompose it and 
on the contrary, even when it's necessary to pass to, to arms, they come of it honorably. The character of the French youth, it will be said, is incompatible with patience and moderation. Uh, truthfully, I would prefer that somebody tell to me that given that it has some inclination to, you know, superficiality and impulsivity, you should let it essentially uh, let it go, right? And, uh, and I believe that uh, no nation uh, is more, uh, let's say, it's, it's more capable of our, than, of, of virtue, at the condition that, to, for it to be taught. Um, and that 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 it should be, you know, that one should push it to also to exercise uh, exercise it. Um. So yes, this is a broader rant about, of course, what was the the discipline in French armies, speaking especially about the youth, and so on. Uh, and there is the interesting comparison with the Spanish that are taken here as a model. Uh, military model broadly for for as you know at this point the Spanish had indeed the most advanced armies in Europe and they had a quite interesting disciplinary system given that it was also quite liberal actually there was no real uh, even punishment for deserters because it was so that serving in the tertia was kind of a you know a great honor rather than so that one would have been always marked just for having abandoned it first place so we'll see that hopefully at some other point um, but uh, one cannot uh, here Delano is, is writing of course from the perspective of a uh, you know of a, of a nobleman that is involved also in some of the most ferocious wars that France had ever seen so there is a great frustration um, there is an obvious uh, let's say uh, you know com general complaint and point that he's making about the current state of affairs and so everything seems worse especially in as much as the uh, you know the idea ah, before the the young man was sent in, in Piedmont were you know so more virtuous and then now they they obeyed whatever now it's all bad they just do they're corrupted for gamble I mean if you study military history at any time you will find that the things that the Lanou complains about I mean especially in early modern times in everywhere pretty much were fundamentally the same so there was a great I mean we made a, a video also about the same Spanish with um, uh, Alfarac, you know, the Spanish rogue that talks about the, the dramatic corruption existing even in the Spanish army so this is not really the point the point is that France was objectively more um, in, in this Delanue is probably right also when he says you know here we are you know the, the French are actually maybe actually the best if they they were better disciplined in that sense but in a moment in which the country was falling apart in which the nobility was of course so historically bold in ways that the you know they were properly also superior aristocratically speaking to say you know the, the Spanish uh, that were by the way had in the Hidalgos, uh, after all, this disadvantage of a warlike gentry rather than nobility proper that they considered, of course, as such, but you know, was also something more, um, uh, let's say, uh, you know, more, more, you know, was different from the French nobility in the first place and was surely less, uh, less, in fact, oligarchic in its own view, right? And, and so that was an enormous arrogance and um, and not that again that, that the, no, the Spanish nobility wouldn't have in, in, in some way um, but the French were uni universally known at the time because of their arrogance in a sense and that stemmed from that that important nobiliar culture that they had retained and in a sense a nobiliar culture was more um, let's say uh, traditionalist in, in properly in the feudal chivalric sense sometimes and that therefore boasted properly in the individuality that the superiority so that's quite interesting as a figure because also French armies had undergone quite a, a change from 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 medieval times at this point there had been all a modernization uh, even a decline properly what of, of the nobility per se in, in relation to the exercise of arms but th this attitude was you know 
saying I'm a noble and therefore I'm better than anybody else was 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 there quite quite powerfully among the French. But what is interesting about the Lanoux um, words here is generally speaking the realization first, first of all of a national dimension, which by the Renaissance times was there. I mean, you know, Europeans considered themselves at this point among you know, as as properly more or less in the national guys that uh, that we do today, or you know, by some approximation, um, and and Delanue is aware properly of the role that his country has, right? That, of course, France was more aware than other countries in Europe of its own national character before. Um, the the still here the wars of, of religion in the country showed dramatically the you know the the national differences that actually existed within the same France. It was actually a group of, of multiple countries that wasn't really a, already a, a unitary thing completely, um, even though under the one same crown, and that, that surely was important. Spain, for example, wasn't like that they, until the later on in Second Modern Age, they would remain still divided in Castilla and Aragon, even though in spite of the dynastic union. So there is a sense, and this is why the Lanoux ideas um, in terms of this necessity of a of of a r political and moral reformation before than than even a military a military institutional one was uh, was necessary for the end of of, of 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 the country as a whole right and this is an, a, an extremely modern thought um, it, it, it goes straight ahead towards I, I can say, you know, maybe, of course, the Lanoux would have, would have despised dramatically the French Revolution, but the idea, say, of, of the compaction of the state into something more unitary and kind of driven by a kind of a more uniform and standardized discipline, even, um, was was surely an idea that, I don't know, the same de Lanoux's ancestors were... Uh, presumably had, hadn't had, at least in his, own, in his own way. So this is an important... Mm, uh, with you know uh, an important mm, figure first of all and work that shows uh, the passage right towards modernity and secularization in this in this fashion now there is also another author justus manius uh, who is perhaps even more important right in this regard um, at least for the connection that con uh, with, with that he had um, with Tacitus, with Machiavelli, laying literally at, at the base of his historiographical meditation. Now, Justus was a was a Lutheran uh, priest, uh, uh, so you know, taking some also important, most radical stance at this point, but would be ins inspired, in fact, by these uh, by these new ideas uh, that he would express in um, some works. Uh, First of all, the Tractatus ad Historiam Romanum Cognoscendum Utilis of 1592, and eventually the De Milizia Romana. Um, he was a German, uh, Thuringian author. He um, married, let's say, the m political uh, reasons of neo-Stoic rigorism in the declared need of a military life that would have to be, at the same time, disciplined, and devoted to abnegation that would make of the soldier essentially a model of virtue, frugality, and severity. And uh, surely this is kind of a, yet another important proof of the recognized need of discipline, of uniformity, that had towards here in the Protestant reform one of the greatest advocates of the same, also in the realization that um, Th this is not just an ideal, that this is an, a practical need for the the situation that was, you know, the empire was falling apart. Uh, it properly in its universal unity, there was uh, there were these new principalities that were autonomizing, they needed their own armies, they needed to, to wage war, to wage war in a way that, by the way, like in the 16th century, nobody had ever seen before, and so uh, was pressuring them to to need properly something that wouldn't be just a temporary uh, involvement in war itself, or just a you know sportly uh, uh, tendency of the aristocracy, but something 
deeper, something that had to encompass the the whole uh, political and social spectrum in a hierarchical form, in a disciplined form. And, and in fact, the thesis of Justus Manius would be fundamental in the military reforms of Maurice of Nassau that we made video about and so we know how you know uh, in love um, and inspired uh, in love with and inspired by the, the classical mm, uh, the, the the Roman the, the the Greek military treatises it was in this important um, passage from say back to shot in a sense where there's some important modifications that would confer to, to the Dutch army against the Spanish some some very um, uh, important qualities, right? Um, naturally adapted to the local, to, to to the specific function, because nothing was seen really in a in a teleological sense. It wasn't properly, uh, even in 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 Maurice of Nassau, the the clarity or the you know properly even the purpose of the necessity to say okay we should just copy. The, uh, the the classical antiquities we should you know that that most of these reforms stemmed from practical purposes that were being investigated on the field and with actual purpose and needs and and reasons that were quite practically based indeed um and this is however the point is that such ideas circulating um are the same ones that, by reform, would substantially remain up to today, right? It's towards a statal model, towards the model, the, the Roman one, right? Um, and so the the Protestants were quite fascinated by the Roman world because of the ethi the Stoic ethics of uh, of sacrifice. That in many ways, and we have seen it also in the video about the moral superiority of Roman civilization, actually was. Uh, was nothing but a coming back of the the older archaic Roman Indo-European religion, and so that there were some connections with that. Even reading Tacitus and uh, the custom of the Germans, that these uh, that these um, uh, um, reformers, in every sense, from a religious and a military point of view, were probably still identifying as in, in connection to to that past world. And this is a, a deep realization. So it wasn't merely actually a more constructive plan necessarily. Than, than than what the universal empire entailed in itself, but it was something that was looking at the practicality of this smaller state that, however, needed to be ever more compact in their own way and capable of resisting to the new waves, to the new storms, um, and needed to do it quickly and at, at that with, with a with a concrete result. Now, um, on the other hand, um, all this should um, so as we've seen the. The ethics of, of sacrifice, renunciation, rigor, right? Th these all were also what soldier life had always been. You cannot say, you know, a, a medieval knight was not about this, these things, right? The problem now was extending it rather to a multitude, right? Even just if you know what the art of war was about, it wasn't done by, by cavalry just anymore. It was with just infantry in a sub auxiliary function. At that point, infantry was the base, right? And not just a random infantry, but uh, thousands of pikemen that had to be rigidly trained and framed in ways that, you know, if you didn't really have the, the, the appearance of a state of reality, you, you couldn't even afford in the first place because your your society and politics would, wouldn't even allow that. And so uh, it's also meaningful that such ideas were born in, in areas that had different degrees of modernization in that sense because they, they also perceived the need of, of that change that was was much greater than we think in historical perspective because these you know nothing like this had ever existed before i mean not even the classical past was actually something like they they thought or they, at least we you know modernity would would take form in this time right as we were saying before so um this this one in parallel with with other ideas also the birth of absolutism in a sense so what was happening is actually also politics was assuming proportions and dignity of a, an autonomous science right um and equally the art of war so uh in turn the um 
a reduction of its own field um, to, however, a you know possible and uh, actually requestable, uh, say obtainable uh, autonomy, right? And bringing arms, being a warrior, um, had been up to great part of the 16th century, something provided by a dignity, with a dignity that shone, let's say, of its own light. This is exactly what the Indo-European of, of the warrior slash Freeman, whatever, wo hero really was, right? It's, it's a relic of that unsecularized, unsecularized past, right? A, a, a man at arms was ideally, and that's why also Delanue was complaining about his French uh, young nobility, that they were they, were, they considered themselves like heroes, like people who could do whatever just because their own, they were so overloaded in moral superiority and actual capacity from an individual point of view that they were, uh, you know, reactionary to, to military reforms that would include a larger amount of troops, greater reliance, of you know over the same but but by by the kingdom in itself so it was a, a big deal for 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 a country held by nobility establishment at that point so what modernity changed in this and this is a victory of machiavelli in a way war was came to be justified essentially uh, under the light of politics itself and specifically at the under the light of the constitution of a state, right? And you understand that here the fil rouge arrives up to von Clausewitz. That makes, of course, of war purely an inst a political instrument. Um, this is an enormous step forward that, as you understand here, it was already being envisaged. Like it, you have to think that in history of civilization, this this concept had never been rationalized. Right, the, the all over the world before the West at this point, it, uh, nobody had thought. But like those feudal knights, that would think to be the only thing because they they thought to be literally superior um, in a way nobody else. When when firearms that weren't the only thing, but properly the need that certain technologies had to be operated because um, in general countries were compacting, they were more unitary, cohesive. They, they waged war more consistently on a larger scale with combined arms, of course could take out that knight that simply, right? Not that simply actually, but still with means that obliged the knight to recognize the need of a, of a larger scale of, uh, you know, comprehension of war that wasn't just about being individually trained as the warrior is, right? They needed soldiers. And we all know how warriors were crushed under the heels of soldiers in the history of civilization, for which it's also, you know, childishly despicable to hear. Even some people today would believe that in the modern military there are still warriors, because that's a complete nonsense. In, in, on the grounds of any kind of military, historical, anthropological, religious understanding, that's a complete denial of, of reality for what has happened. Those people are not warriors. Those people are just, you know, sometimes ju just more apt to a kind of fighting, but they're not warriors. Warriors are something else. And sadly enough, we haven't fully um, modernized in that sense, meaning that that some of those people think they are warriors because they still kind of live like thugs and not like soldiers in a sense. And so uh, our militaries are not perfect. Nobody is. There is always an element of that. It depends on how much it is framed and indoctrinated and, and functional to perform what what a what a what a soldier must perform, right? Because the warrior fights for his own prestige in a way that goes outside the control that is brought under. The soldier is a pure killing machine that doesn't have to have in mind anything else but that, right? And of course, it must have some virtues, nature uh, rather than just a disciplined one. But it has to be all one with the system. Whereas a warrior doesn't quite understand that because he's culturally inferior to it and properly doesn't arrive to even to the concept. And that's how you can see in, in today's policy. People have completely lost the plot in some ways. Of course, never had 
had it at some at some level culturally but you know up to the 19th century it was a pretty crudely violent and and cold clarity about this nowadays even war is being you know people don't study anymore there is not a strategic culture there is not a, a an enlightenment and understanding and this makes even those who think to be warriors actually much weaker than sometimes even individually than what you know a normal soldier was but by those times in some ways in any case these are other considerations but the the meeting between Machiavelli's thesis and the uh, Huguenot military thinkers and and eventually between them and the theorists of the time of the Thirty Years War had after all dramatic consequences also since from that time onwards military theory began to constitute an integrating part of the commander's preparation right that up to that point had been largely considered as achievable only through the field practice this is really important is what we were seeing in the beginning right nobody really you know a 15th century commander needed to to read the jetsus to to know how to fight to command um in the first place uh like it's ridiculous right at this point instead the complexity of warfare even though it was a very gradual change but still conceptually was making the west realize what what were the needs right and benefits of for that scale of war of of a, of, a, of theoretical systematization it's no coincidence they went in parallel right and and also they went in parallel also with depending on on the culture because no country in Europe was kind of alike right these processes were happening in different places at different times but of course the elites or those however you know can think of the military one but also the scholarly ones were becoming more aware and to really you know once in a culture you're exposed to an idea you can't really come back either um, so as a consequence there was also a new model of military theorist so essentially not anymore a philologist or a commentator of the ancient texts or even a you know armchair strategist as doubtlessly also the same the same Machiavelli had been Machiavelli was sometimes on the field in the guise of ambassador and things but he didn't have much of a military eye in that sense um, so that was also an issue because you know the Florence paid sometimes for for this misassessment but um, in any case uh, the new military theorists had to become a technician that would speak in turn on in his on his experience lived directly uh, not less than his studies that were of course as we've seen necessarily always there so we're always talking about commanders at a high level here we're not talking about you know knowing how to fight individually those things were just trained as always uh, you know were were uh, you know because I'm talking about the nobility the nobility would always maintain that kind of individualistic ethos by a certain degree right here we're talking about commanders however so how you had to train the, the wall system and of course also nobility was actually went through that test because especially in the imperial armies through the Spanish example as you know there was this this pride of you know f properly from the nobility to start as uh, an average rank-and-file pikeman and eventually to rise up in through the ranks because it was seen as as a necessity in a way it was seen as an initiation it was still there was still that that uh, need of making the young exposing to threat and danger that, just as it could be in, in the Iron Age war band, right? It was, um, it was necessary for for becoming uh, a military man in the first place, right? But then at the top, there was properly a completely different idea of how the system had to work. And I say this because it seems today that for the majority of people who approach this topic seem to come from backgrounds like reenactment or humor, and they think that sometimes that 
um, you know, I, at least I have perceived overwhelmingly, scalarly and deeply a, a, an individualistic bias that makes them think that it's all about how you think individually as a fighter, but that has nothing to do with how warfare was even before actual military theory. Uh, warfare is something scholarly, dramatically different. It has nothing to do essentially from what your your individual perspective as a fighter fundamentally has. It has to be maybe as an individual perspective as a commander in the field. And still, um, we are not n nor nor actual fighters of those times, nor commanders on the field most of the time. So, what we actually have to study is you know is something that goes way beyond. Of course, the individual perspective, but also what we normally think war could be just without a, an actual strategic education that lasts a, a lifetime, right? That is something that even these same commanders were needing, right, uh, at, at those times. So in, in this, and at this point, the, the art of war was still relatively sim a simple business compared to what would come later. And that's why you needed von Clausewitz and the world German philosophy at the time of, of Kant or Hegel that you know, had to, to explain that. And again, if, if your your mental complexity doesn't doesn't reach the works of Kant and Hegel, you don't even know what that is. It's quite difficult <laughs> in the first place to pretend to know anything about warfare in the first place because it's just, you know, as if you were, you know, I were, you were talking to a child uh, and pretending to know that at the same time. Uh, because really, you can be just a kid and learning those systems and still our kids or the majority of people up to this point have not really ever did. Um, and, and so those people eventually become adults and they remain like that most of the time. Overwhelmingly so, uh, from a statistical point of view. Now, um, so with the feeling of the gap between theory and practice or prejudices that fell in such a precious treaty uh, like uh, the uh, Nef de Prince et de Bataille, written by um, Robert de Balzac, uh, Lord of Entrague, uh, had brought, uh, that had participated, by the way, to the Italian wars at the beginning of the 16th century, um, and, and that had completely, you know, ignored, practically, because at the time everybody was focused on, on the classics, or how to interpret them, uh, etc. There were instead already that early. Roberto Balzac was a 15th century man at arms, right? So it was still, you know, a relatively prim primitive context we're talking about. But he wrote this uh, interesting, you know, conjugation, say what he had seen at war and how he thought war should be waged, uh, you know, the art of war conduct of war should be about, well, this thing had been ignored, right? And and so it took one century, roughly, uh, to, to see instead how precious that intuition was. And it's perhaps symbolically when Jacob e. van Valhausen became the first director of the military school of Siegen. Uh, he was brought there by John the, S the Seventh, uh, of uh, Count of uh, Nassau Siegen, in fact, and um, in in this military uh, school in in uh, in the Rhineland, the two dimensions of theory and experience were completing each other complementarily, and it couldn't be seen otherwise. And given that, also he served. Uh, Maurice of Nassau, again, we see yet another connection with one of the most important reformers, at least in the Protestant world, um, who came to be inspired by practice and theory at the same time, not, so, not by chance. Um, and uh, I figured like Van, uh, Van Valhausen was um, at the same time a great uh, expert uh, and uh, illustrious author of military texts. And behind the um, the wise pages of the Van Valhausen, the Corpus Militare, which was edited in 1617, we also see clearly 
an influence of Justus Manius, right? They, they were all connected. They were coming all from the same, uh, the same philosophy of thought. Um, uh, the 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 titles here of the corpus had to do with the Abetze the Soldaten zum Feld, Kriegskunst zum zu Fuß, Kriegskunst zu Pferd, etc. And these were adopted during the 17th century as uh, you know, very, uh, very famous texts by, by the commanders of the time. And thus, uh, beyond the properly scholastic experience of Siegen, where m the art of war was properly thought, the importance that Justus Menius attributed to discipline and training on the base of his um, stoic Christian convictions was, was leading. They needed that discipline, that uniformity, that rigidity. That was not a way to train this troop. And by the way, the dual debate that stood behind these, these authors, I mean, uh, in this case, I'm actually talking about uh, John VII, Count of uh, Nassau Siegen and the same uh, Jakob Ivan Wallhausen was the need to provide the the German state here with a uh, less of a mercenary force, uh, ad hoc recruited and with the, the money saved, extending uh, the uh, let's say the, the the levy and the training of the local uh, of the local inhabitants, the local population, local subjects. This was important because these theorists were openly discarding the um, the mercenary professionalism in favor of some sort of militia that mm, would be semi-professional in nature already at that time, but still would provide properly the, the population with that sense of connection between the the political uh, identity and the military participation. And this is very important at the, you know, at the beginning of, of a time such as the one of the Thirty Years' War, because fundamentally, uh, after those decades of war, the the, the Westphalian model would, would come with itself, and together with, with it, the, the military organization of of these countries in a somewhat permanent base, with that with that concept deeply ingrained at the root. And so, more than else, the idea that even though there were always mercenaries around, that there Every prince had his own army, which was, in a way, what uh, you know, an army of the local people. Right? This is the point, um, in uh, or at least recruited with a, with a system that would that would uh, allow the the, the 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 increasing involvement of the the local uh, subjects in, in in the armed force. And even when there were lots of you know, foreigners still employed, think about. I mean, the Dutch army was. Uh, Basically, we're all mercenaries, right? So even Maurice of Nassau, in that sense, was not making really an exception. But still, the idea that the uh, aside from the the origin of the human material, but that still, you know, the state could properly directly control that army and the training uh, was fundamental. It's still the basic fact of our modern armies and our level of political coercion and discipline and control that unavoidably uh, you know, reflected itself on also on the territorial uh, one, on the idea of a properly denucleation of a state, not just of a uh, deeply intricated uh, feudal superimposition of you know, rights and so that couldn't even represent on a map banner. So in front of the um, of the fall of chivalry in, in the process, by the way, that would have not, however, exhausted itself, uh, and that in the same 18th century would have actually maintained a sort of, you know, hope, at least for the nobility to, to remain at the head of the state and on horseback on the field. Um, the, um, and, and that... Uh, would uh, would still show how how it was rather than a resurgence, it was properly a continuation of of a, of a European spirit that uh, 
was millennia of years old and was deeply aristocratic in nature, right? And so at this point was was um, being constituted actually another another military system that you know would have forever arranged that political and social balance for that matter. And so if the virtus of the of the night still was structured uh, around the axis of you know prowess, fidelity, courtesy, the honor of the soldier was instead organizing itself around that one of discipline, fealty and renunciation. Which actually is 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 not really to be seen in an oppositional sense, right? First of all, the a great deal of here we see fealty uh, actually in, in in both of the descriptions because the common term is to be intended in the case of the knight in the sense of personal fealty of feudal type, right? It's a personal. It's a, from person to person. In this, the the second sense of fealty is the if you want more like the Roman and statal absolutistic fealty towards the crown, or at least any power that you were serving at that point. And here, I, I don't want to mix too, mu too much cards in, in the Roman sense, because in the Roman sense, actually, uh, the fetus was something deeply rooted in properly the most, some of the most violently and, and, and uh, elitistic and discriminatory aristocratic uh, cultures in the history of mankind Rome was was no democracy fortunately for us uh, uh, in in um, in nor a republic for that matter but still there was uh, it had a, an incredible power it could exercise in fact over the masses of the dispossessed and to turn them into to legionnaires like I don't know the Macedons had done with their own uh, with their own lower classes with the phalanges and so and so this same thing was occurring again right in history in modern Europe at the rise of properly the modern state of something that was more concentrated in power like it had been in the past right something that for for a good millennium had not existed because Europe was fragmented in a heraldic let's say in a feudal uh, forest that was incredibly difficult to, to, to recompose and put together where the, the aristocratic edus had individualistic heroic one had remained on the force so much but still, that heroic character remained, even in part in the soldier. There's some very interesting things we could talk about, for example, about different military cultures, even the, the differences that would stand in between civil law or common law, um, how the necessity of virtue next to discipline was is always needed till, till to this day. They must compenetrate each other, can't exist one without the other. Uh, sure is that the 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 individualistic ethos of um, chivalry, or at least in its more brutal forms, was uh, at that point uh, as or even more brutally erased from the battlefields, where things were working uh, in a very different way. And surely the Ancien Regime at that point didn't bring to this to be anything like a democratic revolution, like people think the Renaissance, where the Renaissance were actually the, the full crystallization of a an, of an elitistic oligarchic aristocratic system right even though there are people who want to see you know a, a general uh, positivity in in the idea that you know in some countries that the state would be more mitigated well this yes as long as you realize that still those states had a success in the moment in which the same people became oligarchic in nature i mean uh, it and, and could uh, therefore hierarchize also military discipline and, and make it of good use. I mean, Britain is one of the best examples. I mean, look at what all the fuss that the parliament made for the ship money and, 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 and consider what the ship money was compared to the the, the enormous amount of money that instead the, it was levied from the country already uh, less than one century later when factually the power of the monarchy had been dramatically shrank it to, to the point of insignificance in the parliament so the same uh, people right now were levying the same money as oligarchs in their own way to the rest of the people and they built a freaking world empire with that so it's actually a very positive thing because it goes together with all with the English uh, you know cultural scientific uh, preeminence and, and everything but let's say one can hardly see in that like a purely you know like 
no, that was a moment of freedom and democracy. And no, right? It was one of also in there, one of some of the most uh, elitistic systems you could find. Uh, in, uh, in at least in comparison to our times, but still that is important because we tend to erase that from the from the the story. But there is there is actually nothing wrong with that, <laughs> right? We we have the, we should get a bit weighted once again to think that really the majority of people do not know really how to handle this stuff, and and it, it is def there is definitely a, a very positive outcome of, from those communities where. The middle class is strong, compact, etc. But this um, doesn't go in parallel with the lack of of um, of a hierarchy at all, or coercive power of, of or or power to core, even militarily meant, right? In its deterrent or non-deterrent force, for that man, deterrent or let's say you know, say better kinetic, <laughs> you know, uh, force in the mo in the moment it's it's unleashed. Um, think about the United States and so that that is incredibly important actually for for the development of civilization you cannot but look at these countries yes in, in that more balanced sense but also realizing that in order to have that system you have to have some important hierarchies that work because of of, of the people that accept for that hierarchy to, to exist to, to control it to check it to have a you know to mitigate it, but without which there can't be anything, um, let's say, unitary and functional, in because there wouldn't be cohesion in the first place at a political level, and consensus does in these things. So it's a bit of a clumsy video maybe today, but I think it's important to to insist on this passage, to insist in, on the on the graduality and how. By the way, this transformation occurred from, let's say, from different areas of Europe. Today we'll talk about Italian, French, German authors. And it seems to me that still this is yet another incredible proof of what w the Western world was already at that time in the capacity of, of reflecting on itself and of finding out, digging out the, these these ideas this for that, that are inherent in reality and that, that just were awaiting to that stage of civilizational development to be properly conceptualized, uh, you know, laid out and and also positively applied. And so that's how the the the, the growth kept kept occurring. Then for today we stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content and for now i thank you heartily for listening to me i wish you a nice time and see you next time bye